Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to our 63rd Planetarium live stream. Uh, thank you to our supporting sponsor, MRI Global, for continuing to support these live streams. I am your Planetarium Specialist, Patrick Hess, uh, and thanks for tuning in. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Glad to see you here. Um, we've got an exciting topic tonight. Uh, hopefully you'll find it interesting. It's uh, uh, going to be all about the ancient astronomy uh, cultures of uh, uh, Europe. So we're going to talk about Northern Europe uh, as well as uh, the British Isles. So it should be pretty fun. Uh, if you're a returning watcher, welcome back. Glad to have your continued support. And just as a reminder, this is a live stream, so we are coming to you live. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the comment section and we'll try to read those as they come. If you want to let us know where you're watching from, it's always fun to see new faces and where they're tuning in uh, from around the country and around the world. So uh, definitely a comment there. And as we are gathering, um, feel free to... Uh, Say hello and let us know where you're watching from. And while we are waiting for uh, some of our crew to join us, I wanted to start uh, how I you normally start by going over some space news. And really the biggest news that's been dominating, dominating the space news cycles is of course the landing of the Perseverance rover. This is the fifth rover that we have sent to the red planet Mars. And it just landed on Thursday. It had a very successful landing. Uh, and we actually did a special live stream on Thursday night. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, as a reminder, we post all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com and search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. And you can find all of our past streams there, including the special Thursday night stream where we talked about the uh, rover landing. Uh, but I did want to bring up to, uh, some updates on that because uh, today NASA had a press conference where they released um, some footage from the Perseverance lander. Now, uh, this is super exciting. Perseverance is the big sister or younger sister, I guess you'd say, of Curiosity, another rover we sent uh, eight years ago. Uh, to the red planet but technology has advanced quite a ways since then and we've got some amazing pictures from curiosity but perseverance was sent to mars with video cameras uh, as well as microphones and so uh, today nasa released video footage from mars of perseverance touching down and i did not want to uh, miss out on showing you all uh, this amazing footage so i'm gonna try to get this loaded up here if i can find my link all right, there it is. Let's uh, full screen this and over here. All right, so oop, you should be able to see here. Uh, so we're just gonna let this play through and there's actually no sound. Um, they do have sound from Mission Control, but um, actually we can go ahead and uh, play the, the sound from the desktop here. Um, so I uh, will be able to hear Mission Control comment on uh, Perseverance. Now you can see the parachute deploying. Again, this is video footage from Mars. How crazy is that? Um, and we talked about uh, the whole landing procedure on uh, Thursday's live stream, so be sure to check that out. Um, but in the meantime, let's uh, just check out this footage. So there we can see the heat shield popping away while Curiosity was uh, thousands of meters above uh, the surface of Mars. And I'm also, let me listen in here just to see if there's anything else they're commentating on. Yep, so they're talking about nine and a half kilometers, so they're still quite a ways up. But that was the heat shield protecting the uh, descent module as it entered the Martian atmosphere. And again, this is, this is video footage from Mars. It seems so crazy. Um, but that is one of the uh, coolest things about Perseverance is that uh, the instruments that we sent on board uh, are very, very advanced. Once again, if you're joining us, we're just watching video footage of Perseverance landing that was released by NASA today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, put those in the comment section. Let us know where you're watching from, too. Love to hear where everybody's tuning in from. So again, this is real. This is actual video footage from Mars. It's My mind is still blown thinking about this. But right now, um, the descent module is hanging by its parachute, coming down. 4.2 kilometers above the Martian surface. And again, uh, there are microphones aboard uh, Perseverance, but they did not capture any audio of this particular part of the descent. Um, but you can look up, there is audio from the surface of Mars that they've already released to the public. We have timing of the landing engine. In a moment, the uh, descent module will separate from the parachute. There it goes, right there. 
Now it's actually uh, moving sideways, which is why the camera changed a little bit as it's looking for its uh, landing spot, which it uses um, artificial intelligence to determine. So it actually picks its landing spot dynamically. One kilometer above, and it's coming down. Again, this is real video footage. It's not doctored. It's not CGI or anything. This is video footage from the red planet, which is really mind-blowing. So uh, once again, uh, Justin just chimed in. Is this when they landed? So amazing. Yeah, so this is video footage NASA released today of Perseverance landing uh, last Thursday. And so we can see the sky crane, uh, which is lowering the Perseverance rover downwards. Um, that is looking upwards at the descent module. Now, before you ask, there is no flames coming out of the rocket engines because the, what the, the propellant that they're burning actually burns transparent. So um, that's not, I'm sure people have already claimed that this is fake because they don't see any fire coming from the sim module. So there you go. Now you can hear Mission Control going crazy. And there's a video footage from Mission Control. So anyway, I just wanted to show that to you all because it's so incredible. And we can post a link to that in the comments section. Uh, Emily is commenting and asking, why was this specific location chosen to land at? Great question, Emily. Uh, and they uh, landed uh, in uh, Jezero Crater, which is actually the site of an ancient lake bed. Uh, similar to Cur Curiosity's landing spot, um, <clears throat> we sent both Curiosity and Perseverance to these dried up lake beds because we think that they are probably the best places um, that if life ever uh, existed on Mars, uh, that would be the best place we could find evidence of it. So great question, Emily. Another question from Eric. Uh, uh, with the thin atmosphere, they must need a huge parachute or two to slow the lander. Indeed, uh, absolutely. And so uh, we saw the parachute, which was 75 feet wide, um, and uh, and it what couldn't slow the lander down uh, enough, so they also had to use propulsive landing uh, using rockets to slow it down and then a sky crane to lower it all the way. Justin says, it's just unreal how we can do that from that far away. And the coolest thing, Justin, is that that was all automated because Mars is so far away, we couldn't remote control it live um, because it takes 15 minutes for the signals from Earth to reach Mars. So that was all automated. Um, so uh, Mission Control was actually waiting just to hear back from Perseverance whether or not it landed because it was going to do it all on its own, which is pretty crazy. Um, so uh, let me uh, just go a little bit farther or up in the comments. We've got a couple people who tuned in earlier. Aaron says, awesomeness. Thanks for watching, Aaron. Uh, Tammy, one of our longtime watchers, says, hello from Iowa. Thank you again for doing these. We have learned a lot and always enjoy listening to you and seeing Phoebe. Uh, I think we'll have Phoebe join us in just a minute. Eric also earlier said, howdy from Lenexa. And is watching from downtown KC. Thanks for tuning in, you all. And Christian says, hello from across the bridge in KCK. Thank you for watching, Christian. Uh, Will says, uh, definitely not much surface tectonic activity or surface activity given all the meteorite impact sites visible. Right, um, so uh, Will, that's a great point about Mars. Um, because Mars uh, does not have a lot of geologic activity or um, meteorolo me meteorological activity, um, so erosion from uh, water and wind, for example, uh, the surface of Mars is really uh, like uh, uh, looking billions of years into the past because it's relatively unchanged. Uh, by the way, if you want to learn more about Mars, one of our past live streams on uh, August 10th of last year, we took a deep dive into the Red Planet, which was a whole stream all about Mars. And by the way, one last plug, actually not last, I'm going to plug this repeatedly. Um, if you go over to youtube.com and find our YouTube channel at the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium. Uh, please uh, check out all of our past live streams there. Uh, and please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel too. We are nine subscribers away from 100 subscribers, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a pretty huge deal. Uh, and if we get to 100 subscribers, we can actually become a real YouTube channel. Uh, so we won't have to um, uh, tell people to search for us. I could just tell you uh, a website or a URL to go to. So only nine subscribers away from 100. It's a tiny goal, but in this day and age, we'll take what we can get. So please head over to youtube.com, search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, and give us a su subscription there if you don't mind. Uh, Emily says that must have felt like the longest 15 minutes of their lives in reference to waiting for uh, the signal from Mars indeed. In fact, uh, the seven minutes during the descent, uh, they call the seven minutes of terror. Uh, and then we've got a hello from Vera and Charlie. Uh, thanks for tuning in, y'all. All right, so we are going to dive into our deep dive topic today, uh, which is kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, we've taken a look at um, uh, mythology and astronomy from a bunch of different cultures. Uh, so during our seasonal star tours, of course, we talk a lot about 
um, uh, Greco-Roman astronomy, just because that's what many of the constellations we see today are based off of. Um, and we actually took an even deeper dive into uh, ancient Western astronomy last Monday uh, on the 15th of February. So check out that live stream if you want to learn more about that. Uh, but we've taken uh, deep dives into uh, the sky cultures of Africa and Asia all the way back in June 15th of last year. And then uh, the week after that, on June 22nd, we looked at uh, sky cultures of the Americas, so Central and Native America and North America. Um, so a lot of interesting uh, topics and, or a lot of different uh, perspectives uh, on the night sky that people around the world have seen. And uh, one area of the world that we haven't covered yet is uh, Northern Europe. Um, so we're going to take this kind of in two sections. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Celtic people, and then we'll also talk about uh, the Norse mythology and its connections to the night sky. Um, so, why don't we start with uh, the Celts? So, just a little uh, brief uh, sort of primer on who the Celtic people are. This is a flourishing culture uh, that dominated much of Central Europe during the Late Bronze Age. Uh, this is up to the rise of the Roman Empire, uh, which um, pushed the Celts north to the British Isles. So, a lot of Celtic tradition uh, we often think of as being centered around the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, and England, um, but it really started around Europe. Uh, and once again, you can learn more about uh, Greco-Roman astronomy on last week's live stream. And the cool thing about um, uh, Celtic uh, uh, astronomy and history as it connects to the night sky is that there are a lot of uh, ancient structures throughout the UK that um, are some of the most well-preserved uh, ties to ancient astronomy. And, uh, you know, perhaps the most famous example of this is Stonehenge. Um, now, Stonehenge, uh, along with many other uh, circular stone structures found throughout uh, England, and the British Isles, um, it had been theorized for a long time that uh, they uh, were connected to astronomy, uh, but we didn't really have proof until relatively recently when uh, some modern astronomers did some calculations and uh, adjusted for different changes with the Earth's rotation and uh, its uh, axial angle, uh, and basically uh, determined once and for all that yes, these structures did connect to astronomy. Uh, we do have proof there. So Stonehenge, for example, um, was a connected uh, to our night sky and specifically the positions of uh, the sun and the moon and so here's just a chart showing us uh, that connection there uh, basically the way the way these stone markers were mapped out um, the stones along the outside and then uh, these um, trilithons that we find on the inside the three stones so the two uh, going up and then the one across the top um, they align with uh, the positions of the sun and moon at certain uh, important points in the year uh, the solstices specifically. Uh, the solstices uh, are uh, the time when uh, the sun is up for the longest and shortest amount of time, basically. So the summer solstice is the longest day of the year, uh, when the sun is highest at its peak. Um, and then the winter solstice is the shortest day of the year, when the sun uh, is lowest at its peak. Uh, and so you can see, uh, standing here at the very center of Stonehenge, uh, the um, positions and spots, uh, gaps between these stones line up perfectly with these solstices. And they also line up with the, the moon's position during the solstices as well. Uh, and then not only is the, the sunset and sunrise angle, but also um, the uh, height of the sun. So the sun at its highest point during these time periods. You can actually explore, explore Stonehenge yourself. Uh, there is a website you can go to, which um, we can put in the comments section, if I can find the comments section here. Um, and uh, let me just show you that. This is, uh, this is the um, a Stonehenge uh, historical website. So um, the, uh, uh, the, I believe the Stonehenge Museum or Historical Society that's in charge of it has this uh, great interactive website that has a 360 panorama of Stonehenge. Uh, but you can look at Stonehenge at different points in the day. And this shows us a current view um, but we can, for example, fast forward to sunrise, and although today is not a solstice, if you uh, went to this website on one of those days, then you would be able to see um, the positions of things. Uh, and then we can also um, uh, put markers here that'll show us. So these are the trilithons uh, and uh, other parts called heel stones, and uh, they have names for all these different types of stones, but this shows us basically where they all align. We can also overlay uh, details about the position of the sun so you can see the sun's arc at its highest point in the summer and lowest point in the winter how that corresponds with these stone positions as well so anyway just kind of a fun website um and during the solstices they offer uh, virtual events as well so you can tune in uh, with thousands of people around the world and watch the solstices virtually uh and sort of in virtual reality and get to experience this as ancient cultures may have uh, for these ancient structures 
So essentially these ancient structures like Stonehenge acted as a sort of uh, ancient calendars uh, and uh, timekeeping tools uh, as well. So um, Stonehenge is one example, but there are a few uh, other examples of ancient structures. Uh, this is the Warren Field calendar, which is located near uh, Craith's Castle in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. Uh, and this uh, was created likely by hunters, uh, hunter gatherers around 8000 BCE. Um, so over 10,000 years ago, uh, people created this calendar and it's thought to uh, be the world's oldest calendar that we've discovered to this day. Um, there are 12 pits that are believed to correlate with the phases of the moon used, uh, so it was used as a lunar calendar. And it also aligns to the sunrise at winter solstice, um, which uh, correlates the solar year with the lunar cycles on this. Uh, this map, uh, according to archaeological evidence, was likely maintained and periodically reshaped over hundreds of times over the past 6,000 years as uh, the lunar and solar cycles have shifted um, because of the axial tilt shifting the Earth uh, and precession and a lot of other things like that. Um, although it was stopped being used uh, 4,000 years ago, so um, it was used for a long time, but even then it's uh, been a long time since it's been used. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some stories from Celtic astronomy. Uh, and before we do that, let me jump back over to the comments. Uh, remember, this is a live stream. If you have any questions or comments, throw those in the comment section. If you want to give a shout out or just say hello and let us know where you're watching from, we'd love to hear there, that as well. Will uh, is commenting on Stonehenge, um, is saying, so it's a large calendar, so to speak, used for planting, harvesting. Yeah, absolutely, Will. So these uh, ancient structures uh, were used as calendars. So um, you know, especially uh, in the early days of, of human history when we um, were uh, sort of transitioning from a hunter-gatherer culture to uh, agriculture, you know, it was useful to have these calendars to predict things like the changing of seasons, which is helpful for planting and harvesting crops. And uh, we'll find stories in the stars also uh, correlating with those uh, changes as well. Uh, Cindy says the Stonehenge exhibit in Kansas City emphasized it as a burial site. Absolutely, Cindy. Thanks for bringing that up because we did have a Stonehenge exhibition at Union Station uh, a couple of years ago, which was pretty awesome. Talked about the history of Stonehenge uh, and um, and it went through. Uh, so as part of that exhibit, and we won't go into too much detail, but Stonehenge has thousands of years of history and uh, different parts of it were uh, built and added on at different periods of time. And it was once thought to be used as a burial site as well. Mark says hello from Shawnee. Thanks for doing these shows as they're both very informative and entertaining. Well, thanks, Mark. I'm glad that we keep you both entertained and informed. Uh, that is awesome to hear. Emily says, uh, that's so awesome about YouTube. I'll subscribe tonight. Thanks, Emily. Tell all your friends to subscribe as well. Oh, it looks like update. We're at 95 subscribers, just five subscribers to go. Um, very exciting. Uh, and again, it's a very tiny milestone. But if we could hit 100 subscribers, uh, that would just be so awesome. I know my bosses would love that. You know, big numbers always look good. So uh, yeah, so five more subscribers, go over to youtube.com, search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium, uh, hit us up there and uh, hopefully we'll hit 100. It'd be crazy if we could hit 100 uh, by the end of this stream. We're at 96 subscribers, oh my gosh, we're getting up there guys. Thank you so much for your support. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some Celtic astronomy. Now, uh, because uh, Celtic culture was tied uh, to uh, Roman influence and um, uh, they, they have been around for, uh, Celtic culture was around since before Roman times, but uh, also after Roman times and uh, as Often is the case when a, uh, a civilization conquers most of the world, uh, a lot of their traditions sort of get carried over to some of the other cultures that they uh, sort of assimilate. So a lot of the cult, uh, Celtic astronomy is related to uh, Roman and Greek astronomy, um, but uh, we are going to hop on over to Stellarium, which is a free bit of software uh, that you can use uh, to learn all about the night sky. Uh, and we are going to look at our night sky with all the constellations up here. Uh, and um, we are going to talk a little bit about some of the constellations and how they relate to Celtic, Celtic astronomy. So one constellation that is familiar and has been up in our winter night sky is Perseus. Perseus is associated with the Andromeda story. And here we can see Perseus uh, right there near Andromeda, Perseus being the uh, Greek and Roman hero who defeated Medusa and rescued Andromeda from the sea monster. 
Uh, as for a Celtic tradition, though, um, Perseus is associated with a couple different characters, as is the case. And I want a disclaimer here, by the way, that um, we're just going to be talking about a couple stories. There may be other stories you've heard of that I don't mention. But uh, as with any culture that spans tens of thousands of years, um, there are a lot of different stories. And there's not just one uh, story associated with all of them. So we're just going to... Uh, bring in a couple stories here. So Perseus um, is often associated with the Welsh hero of Lula Geifs, uh, who uh, was the child of Arianhad, who, uh, who herself was represented by the constellation Corona Borealis, uh, which is the Northern Crown, which is a nearby constellation as well. Um, but we're not going to find that right now. Let's just focus on Perseus. Um, so uh, Perseus was uh, killed by his treacherous, or sorry, not Perseus, um, Lula Geifs was killed uh, by his treacherous wife and her lover. Uh, but, the, but at the moment of his death, his soul turned into an eagle. Um, and the eagle is named Gualchme, or the Hawk of May. Uh, now his uncle Gwydion searched for him and found him as the constellation Aquila after traversing the Milky Way and eventually restored him to life again. Um, so this story ties in a bunch of religious beliefs regarding birth, death, and rebirth uh, of the sun from Celtic legends. Um, Aquila, by the way, is a summertime constellation, um, which we'll find over here near the swan. There is Aquila the eagle. So another tie in uh, with uh, Greek mythology. Now, near Perseus is Pegasus, the winged horse. Now, uh, Pegasus was said to be the horse of Lyre, the sea god, also uh, representing the goddess uh, Epona. Uh, let me jump back over here because I forgot. Uh, so anyway, this is the, to go back a little bit, this is Lula Geifs uh, and the eagle, that part of the myth. And then uh, there is uh, the horse. So um, Pegasus, again, uh, represented uh, a couple of different characters, one being the goddess uh, Epona riding her white horse. Epona was said to be the protector of horses, donkeys, and mules, as well as the goddess of fertility. Uh, this uh, feature over here is a giant chalk horse carved into a hillside at Uffington in southern England, and some archaeologists think it may represent Epona, and it likely dates back uh, to 14,000 to 500 BCE. So a lot, a lot of ancient uh, Neolithic structures uh, or uh, ground carvings. We'll see a few others in our stream today. There's also uh, Hercules, um, who uh, was said to represent a fertility god uh, in uh, Celtic cultures. Some myths suggest that Hercules is actually the father of the Celts, and uh, it was occasionally mixed with another Celtic god, Ogmios, who was the Celtic deity of eloquence. And there are a couple of Neolithic structures, um, or ancient structures, as you say, like the Long Man of Wilmington and the Cern Abbas Giant. Uh, now, these are potentially Neolithic mon monuments, but there is some evidence to suggest they may have been constructed more recently, closer to the 1700s. Um, but uh, this uh, structure uh, definitely uh, ties in with that uh, fertility aspect, which is why it is censored there. Um, then, of course, there is Orion the Hunter back over in Stellarium. Orion is one of the uh, dominating constellations of our winter skies. It is the brightest constellation in the night sky. Let me hide this grid here. Um, and uh, this uh, was sometimes associated, associated with uh, Kernonos in Celtic mythology, who was uh, another god of fertility, as well as uh, animals, wealth, and the underworld. Really covered a lot of bases there. Um, uh, he was said to be a, a horned deity here. Um, and uh, the ancient Irish called it uh, Kaimau, which means the armed king. Um, there is also Gemini, the twins, another wintertime constellation. Ooh, looks like the moon is in Gemini right now. Uh, and Gemini was seen by the Celts as not as twins, uh, like Castor and Pollux, uh, their Roman counterparts, but the Celts saw it as uh, two men battling over the love of a woman. The men were named Gwyn and Gwerther, and they were the sons of Agridal, who uh, were seeking the hand of the lady in red, Crudilad. Uh, so in ancient times, red was uh, often the color a bride wore to show her purity, uh, unlike modern days where it's white. Uh, and in Celtic traditions, Gwyn and Gwerther are known as the rivals of May, and they're interpreted as being the light and dark halves of the year, battling it out as they set at midnight on the first day of May. So the constellation there, setting at midnight uh, in the springtime. Oh, just an update. It looks like we actually hit 100 subscribers. We're at 101 subscribers. Oh my goodness. Thank you all so much for your support. That's so amazing. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, update our YouTube channel and we are now official. That is so cool. Uh, but we could use more than 100 subscribers. So go over there if you haven't yet and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's YouTube channel. And hopefully we'll have an even easier link to find. That is so amazing. Thank you all so much for your support. I can't believe that happened within like five minutes. That is so awesome. And with so many subscribers, we should use our YouTube channel more often. Maybe we'll post more exciting things there. If you would like us to post more uh, short clips on our YouTube channel, let us know 
in the comments because that's something that we've been thinking about doing. Uh, so uh, that uh, kind of does it for our discussion of Celtic tradition. Uh, we're going to move right along, but first we're going to hop on over to the comment section. Don't forget, this is a live stream. If you've tuned in uh, before we or after we've started, uh, then uh, let us know that you're watching. Let us know where you're watching from. It's always fun to see new faces and where they're tuning in from. Kelly is watching uh, and says, this is a fantastic topic. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kelly. Glad you're enjoying it. And don't forget, if you're interested in this type of topic, that we have a lot of other amazing live streams for you. Uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Viv says subscribe. Thank you so much, Viv, for supporting us. That is so amazing. Uh, Katrina says, what is the brightest star in the night sky? That's a great question, Katrina. And that star is actually visible right now. Uh, and it will be near Orion. In fact, if you draw an imaginary line through Orion's belt down into the sky, it points right at this star. And that star is named Sirius. It is the dog star, part of a dog constellation named Canis Major one of Orion's hunting dogs. So let's, uh, let's bring all those stars and constellations back. There we go. All right, great question, Katrina. Uh, Katrina also says subscribe. Thanks for supporting us, Katrina. And Katrina's watching from Raymore. Awesome. Uh, Angel, uh, Angel's watching from Springfield. And thank you, Angel, for tuning in as well. All right, guys, we are going to move right along. Wow, that's so exciting. I can't believe we hit 100 subscribers. That is really awesome. It's the little things, you know. All right, so let us shift our focus now to another European culture. Uh, and that is the Norse people or Scandinavian people as they are modern or called in modern times. Um, so uh, Norse cosmology and astronomy is pretty famous. Uh, the Norse gods and goddesses, uh, they dominated uh, the cultures of the Viking Age. So the Vikings uh, were from around uh, the year 800 to 1100 CE. So that's uh, modern times around medieval times or right before medieval times in Europe. And these uh, were called the uh, Norse people or North Germanic peoples. Uh, and their modern descendants include the Icelanders, Norwegians, and Swedes. And again, in modern times, we call them Scandinavians. Uh, but they had quite an interesting uh, tradition, cos cosmological tradition, and they had some interesting connections to our night sky as well. Now, uh, the sources... Um, Ooh, oh, so actually I'm just seeing a follow-up question from Katrina uh, on uh, the brightest star. That is Sirius. So Sirius is a star. Uh, Katrina is asking if it's a star or nebula. Uh, and it is indeed a star, a very bright star. Uh, and uh, there are a few nebulas you can see in the night sky, but they're very dim and a bit harder to spot. So a good question, Katrina. That is a star as well. Also, I'm seeing that Sylvia is watching from Independence. Thanks for tuning in. And Kim from uh, Paola. So thank you all for watching. All right. Hopefully we answered y'all's questions. If you have any more, please put them in the comment section. But we're going to move right along talking about the Norse mythological traditions and its association with, with astronomy. Now, most of the uh, sources of uh, Norse mythology come from uh, a writings called the Poetic Edda um, uh, and uh, the uh, Prosetic Edda. And these were uh, this is the modern name for an untitled collection of Old Norse anonymous poems that were compiled in around the 1200s, so right after sort of the period of the Vikings. Uh, and this is our most important and uh, one of the very few sources of our modern understanding of Norse mythology, as well as Germanic heroic legends. Another couple problems with our study of Norse mythology. One, there are not many sources. Uh, and also, um, it, as with many things in medieval times, a lot of the writings use Latin and Greek names just because they often liked writing uh, about uh, history in Latin uh, as well as Greek. And then also in the 1800s, uh, there was kind of a fad that popped up around the world um, that romanticized uh, Norse traditions and gave rise to even newer names and traditions. So there are all these layers and muddled uh, histories. But um, we do have a few uh, uh, primary sources of Norse mythology. Uh, now, it's interesting, though, because we should have more, you'd think, uh, considering that uh, the uh, Viking people were uh, considered to have mastered navigation and seamanship. After all, they uh, conquered a lot of uh, the, uh, the European region around that time. They were well known for that. Uh, so they were definitely experts in astronomy as, as pertaining to celestial navigation. I do want to mention, if you want to learn more about celestial navigation and the different techniques that people around the world use throughout history, I did a very fun live stream uh, while I was on vacation, actually. Uh, it was shot on location. I'll just give a hint there. And that's uh, from November 16th last year. So watch that one. It's a bit fun and has a, def has a bit of a, a change of scenery than what we're used to for our live streams. Uh, so 
Now that I'm just really proud of that live stream, so I try to plug in any chance I get. Um, so, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, so we're talking about Norse mythology. Now, like uh, the Greeks and Romans and many cultures around the world, uh, they uh, connected their uh, celestial objects with characters from their cosmology and mythology, uh, just like many other ancient religions. Uh, for example, the sun uh, is personified as a goddess uh, named Sol, uh, which is Old Norse for sun. And the moon is personified as a male entity named Mani, uh, which is Old Norse for moon. Go figure. Uh, kind of interesting though that the genders of the sun and the moon are sort of reversed from what we traditionally think of, at least from Greco-Roman mythology. Uh, the sun is uh, often a male god and the moon is often a female goddess, so weird that the Norse mythology kind of reversed that. Uh, now in their mythology, the sun and the moon circle the heavens because they're being pursued by giant wolves named Skull and Hati Hruvitnesen. <laughs> um, these were wolves that chased the sun and the moon through the sky. And the earth was also personified as Joro. Night is personified as the female Jotun uh, or giant Nott. Day is personified as Dagger and Dagger's father, the god Dellinger, uh, which is Old Norse for shining, may in some manner personify the dawn. Uh, and there are other uh, mythological personifications uh, as well. Now, one of the things that dominate uh, Norse mythology is the concept of Yggdrasil, which is uh, called the World Tree. And this is an immense, uh, immense sacred tree around which all the universe exists, including the Nine Realms. It's the geographic, geographic center of the Norse spiritual cosmos. Um, and the reason I bring it up is uh, not so much that it pertains to astronomy, but uh, the way that their mythology uh, worked is that they almost considered um, these different realms as, uh, you could think of them as like other dimensions. Now we've kind of talked about uh, the existence of other dimensions in live streams, although we've not done a deep dive topic on it. If some, that's something you're interested in, let us know in the comments. But uh, basically there were nine different sort of planes of existence uh, that various beings from these pre-Christian Germanic mythologies existed. There was Midgard, which is the world of humanity, but there was also Asgard, the world of the Iser, uh, or Acer tribe of gods and goddesses. Um, and uh, these were not the end-all, be-all gods in Norse mythology. More, excuse me, Norse mythology. They were just uh, another group of uh, sort of godlike figures. And there were the Vanaheim, uh, or the Vanir rather, that lived on Vanaheim, uh, who were another tribe of uh, competing gods. The Jotunheim were um, Jotunheim uh, consisted of the world of giants. There was Niflheim, which was a primordial world of ice, and Muspelheim, which was a primordial primordial world of fire. Alfheim, which is the world of the elves. Um, and Svartalheim, the world of the dwarves. Uh, and so all these different realms uh, were connected by this world tree, uh, almost like parallel realities. So kind of an interesting feature. Uh, and uh, again, there may be some science to the existence of parallel universes, uh, but that's something we may have to cover in a future live stream. Now, one uh, interesting thing is that there is evidence that uh, the Nordic people uh, were uh, had ve a very advanced understanding of uh, the calendar system and the the uh, the um, and, and tracking uh, the days and years and, and such. Uh, there's actually evidence that suggests they knew the difference between sun time and star time. Uh, we call this solar time and sidereal time. Uh, so just really uh, quickly to let you know what this is, basically um, there is a difference between uh, the position of the earth around the sun uh, to uh, the position of the stars throughout the day. So for example, one day uh, that we normally think of as 24 hours, um, but because the Earth is not only rotating around its axis, but moving around the Sun, um, it actually takes less time for the stars to reach their same position, which is important if you're dealing with navigation. Uh, because if you're navigating at nighttime, you want to learn the positions of the stars, and it actually takes 23 hours and 56 minutes uh, for the stars to reach their same position, because again, the Earth is moving around the Sun as it's rotating. So that's one sidereal day, um, or a, a star day, as the uh, ancient Nordic people may have known it as, and then the Sun day, um, uh, not to be confused with the day of the week, but the Sun day uh, would be that 24-hour day when the Sun is in the same position. Uh, so they used uh, their knowledge of uh, other things like moon phases and positions of the sun to create an incredibly accurate calendar that was actually uh, uh, could be used repeatedly. Um, so this is a reusable calendar uh, called a runic calendar, uh, and these were based on a 19-year-long uh, 
cycle called a metonic cycle. And this is basically a period of approximately 19 years after which the phases of the moon start recurring on the same day of the year. So you know how your birthday, for example, is the same day of the uh, is the same date of the year every year, but it doesn't fall on the same day of the week. Well, in the same way, the moon phases don't always fall on the same day of the year, um, but every 19 years they actually do. They go on a cycle like that. Um, so these calendars were often carved into wood, bone, or horns. And you can actually make your own calendar. Um, there's a, a calendar. It might be a little hard to read on our stream, but we're actually in the third metonic cycle. Um, so basically what that means is if you uh, look at this uh, golden number here, uh, and you can find that three there. So basically we can see that the next full moon will happen on February 27th. And if you look that up, uh, that is true that this Saturday will be the next full moon. Uh, so these calendars can work uh, every 19 years. They just uh, restart their cycle. So this is the third cycle. And so you just look for this three and that shows you where uh, the full moon is. So pretty useful calendar invented by uh, the Norse people. Uh, jumping back into the co comments real quick. Uh, we had Kelly asking, uh, is a, that a unicorn next to Orion? Uh, and let's go back over to um, our uh, night sky here. Um, and uh, yes, well, in, in the picture here um, in our software, they do have a, a unicorn. And, um, and now, interestingly, uh, we do talk about uh, this constellation on last week's live stream, so I won't go into it in too much detail. But this is actually a more modern constellation that was uh, sort of invented or created, I should say, uh, in the 17th century. Uh, and it is one of the very few constellations that is not tied to uh, ancient astronomy. It's actually uh, related to... Um, uh, a biblical representation. So uh, this, along with uh, two other constellations, are actually uh, were created by um, a Dutch cartographer named Petrus Plankius, who uh, created three constellations that were sort of tied to uh, the Christian Bible. So a great question there. Um, uh, Kelly. Uh, Sarah says, what is the dimmest star? Well, that's a question we really can't answer. Um, one, because the night sky is, uh, our view of the night sky will differ depending on where you are. So in some places, like near a city, you might not be able to see all the stars because of light pollution. Uh, then if you get far away from the city, uh, you'll be able to see uh, many more stars. And then your eyesight um, could differ as well. And then if you use a telescope, then we can see millions of stars and there really is no such thing as a dimmest star. Uh, but that's still a good question, uh, and uh, hopefully that uh, clears it up a little bit for you. Now, Ross says, what's the giant snake in uh, the Norse mythology tree? Ah, so that picture um, that we saw earlier, oops, uh, in that art. Uh, yes, um, that uh, is another feature in Norse mythology, uh, and that snake is called Jormungandr, um, who uh, is also known as the World Serpent. Uh, and uh, this um, this character I'm not super familiar with. It's a little bit more mythological and less related to the night sky, um, but um, it has to do with the uh, creation myth, I believe, uh, and how the earth was created in Norse mythology, uh, as well as Ragnarok, which is the prophesized end of, of the world in Norse mythology, but uh, great question there. By the way, we're already up to 103 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is so crazy. Thank you all, much, uh, all so much for supporting us. Uh, in that way. So real quick, I wanted to talk about the days of the week because uh, this also relates uh, to uh, uh, the Norse connection to uh, um, uh, to uh, astronomy in a way, since uh, all these calendars are related to astronomy. Uh, and um, so back then, they uh, used their uh, their monthly calendar was also so associated with this weekly calendar. So you can see here um, the days of the week are, are connected to this um, this runic calendar as well. These are uh, these are translated, obviously. You can see here the actual runic calendar used runes, so actual uh, Norse lettering. Uh, but I just wanted to bring up real quick that uh, our weekday names, the ones that we're familiar with in English, are actually uh, directly related to a Germanic uh, uh, the, their Germanic, Germanic origin. So Sunday, for example, comes from Old English, uh, which again came from uh, from uh, Norse mythology. Uh, and this uh, is uh, the Sun's Day, uh, which um, is uh, do, 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 uh, the Sun is personified uh, as Suna or Sol. So it is the Sun's Day. And then Monday is uh, Moondage, uh, which is the Moon's Day. And then Tuesday is uh, 
as Tuesday, uh, which is uh, T-I-W-2, uh, is related to uh, the Norse god Tyre, who is the one-handed god associated with single combat and pledges in North mythology, uh, and uh, was uh, also prominent in other Germanic paganism. Wednesday uh, is um, reference uh, references the Germanic god Woden, uh, who uh, is associated with Odin. Uh, and there is Thursday or Thor's Day, uh, represent, uh, representing a Thor, um, the uh, god of thunder. And Friday is a Frigga Dej, uh, which is referencing uh, 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 Frigga, uh, another um, a Norse god. And then Saturday uh, is just connected to um, the, uh, the, the Greco-Roman uh, mythology, so that one is not connected to Norse mythology. They just borrowed it from the Greeks and Romans. All right, so a couple constellations. Now, Stellarium here is pretty cool because uh, we can actually switch uh, sky cultures. They didn't have, uh, they don't have a built-in sky cultures of uh, the Celtic mythology, but they do have a couple from Norse mythology, so we'll touch on a couple of these briefly. Um, oh, by the way, the, the uh, Norse people saw the stars. Uh, I consider the stars to be sparks from Moosful time, the primordial world, primordial world of fire. And the Milky Way is sometimes seen as representing the Rainbow Bridge or the Bifrost, which connects Asgard to Midgard. So let's look at one of these constellations. There aren't a lot here, but there are a couple that uh, we can tie to mythology. So this is um, uh, Arvindil's Toe, which is the modern day constellation of Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. Uh, the story that uh, is tied in here involves a fight between Thor and the giant Hrungni. So Thor was injured in the fight, and a small piece of stone got stuck in Thor's head. In order to get it out, he sought the help from Vala, a type of oracle named uh, from a Vala, which is a type of oracle. Uh, when Thor felt that the stone was coming out, he told the oracle that uh, uh, um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm just realizing uh, there's a typo in my notes here. Um, uh, so anyway, the story involves the oracle helping Thor get the stone out. Uh, but at one point, uh, the oracle's husband, who's named Arvindil, um, is involved in this story. And uh, basically, um, as they were trying to escape the land of the giants, so where he was fighting this giant, uh, Arvindil's toe uh, froze. Uh, and Thor broke it off so they could uh, escape and the toe became a star or a constellation uh, and um, uh, there it is. So a bit of a convoluted story, but that is meant to represent some sort of toe. Uh, there is the wolf's mouth, uh, which we'll find over here. Uh, this is actually part of the constellation Taurus, uh, which is uh, the bull's head right here. Uh, and this is said to be one of the two wolves that's chasing the sun and the moon. We can see that it's located near the ecliptic, which is the apparent path of the sun through the sky. It's also where you'll find the moon, or where the moon will appear close to. Uh, and so uh, that correspondence there, uh, we can kind of see that this uh, wolf's mouth uh, is following the sun wherever it is on that path. Orion is said to be the fisherman, or at least these three stars in its belt. Uh, and then there are the dippers, which were said to be chariots. And so there is the man's chariot or woman's chariot uh, represented by the big and little dipper. And these chariots were said to belong to Thor and his stepmother, Freya. And then there is uh, the constellation over here, which is the modern day constellation of Auriga, which is said to be uh, the battlefield of the Asur. Uh, this is said to represent Ragnarok, which is the prophesied end of all existence as uh, the uh, Acer, the people of Asgard, uh, were battling uh, at the end of the world, basically. So uh, a couple constellations there, uh, and we're going to jump back over to the comment section as we are going to be starting to wrap up this little stream. Uh, and actually, before I forget, let's bring in my assistant, uh, Phoebe, see if she'll join us for the end of this stream. Hi, hey, come here. She was taking a little nap, so let's see how grumpy she is. All right, Phoebe, let's see what people are saying in the comments section. Once again, we are going to be wrapping up our stream shortly today, so if you have any last-minute questions or comments, throw those in, into the comment section. Uh, Katrina says, wasn't Caesar a part of the calendar and making it days of the week? Yeah, so the calendar uh, has uh, quite a, an interesting history going all the way back to Roman times and then, it, of course, influenced, as we discussed, by uh, Northern Germanic tradition. Um, but uh, the days of the week were 
uh, a big part of uh, the uh, Roman history as well. And I believe we talk about that in one of our past live streams. Oops. Um, let me see if I can find which live streams. Uh, oh, thanks for the kisses, Phoebe. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, so we talked about that. Oh, in our moon live stream, we did a live stream all about Earth's moon, and that was on November 30th. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the days of the week in their history, uh, Katrina and anyone else, be sure to check out that live stream, our moon live stream. And again, you can find that on our YouTube channel. Mark says, in relation to Norse mythology and the constellations of astronomy, how many constellations come from the Norse versus Greek or Roman mythology? Great question, Mark. Um, and uh, we talk a lot about that on last week's live stream. We kind of break down where all of the constellations uh, come from. Uh, but just to give you an overview, uh, essentially uh, most of the constellations, um, 47 of them to be precise, uh, come from uh, Ptolemy's uh, writings around the uh, around 140 uh, or 150, um, so the year 140, 150, uh, and uh, Ptolemy was a Roman citizen living in Alexandria, and he based those 47 constellations on uh, his uh, understandings of ancient tradition, but he only saw the northern hemisphere. Uh, so there were 13 constellations uh, that uh, came from southern hemisphere cultures uh, that were added in the 1600s. Seven of them uh, were just basic uh, tools and assorted animals added in the late 1600s. Three of them were biblical creatures, as I mentioned earlier, added by Petrus Plancius in 1613. 17 were navigation tools from French astronomer Nicolas Louis de la Caille, who was in, uh, added these constellations in 1763. And then one was from Egyptian history. Um, so actually none of our modern 88 constellations uh, are from Norse mythology. Uh, but again, uh, the lines are really blurry as um, the uh, historical traditions cross over, uh, you know, uh, ancient Rome uh, occupied much of uh, Europe for nearly a thousand years. So uh, there is a lot of gray area as a lot of these stories sort of blend into one another. Um, let's see, uh, Katrina is uh, mentioning something about Freya and Thor being related. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of different versions of Norse mythology, uh, Katrina. Uh, and uh, again, our understandings are fairly limited because uh, a lot of um, a lot of the history is passed down orally, and then the only writings we really have, uh, again, are from that poetic Edda. Um, so uh, these things differ. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there is uh, the Norse mythology popularized by Marvel Comics and the Marvel movies, and they actually change quite a bit uh, in those as well. So uh, those aren't exactly accurate to uh, Norse mythology, but um, it just, uh, it just as interesting, if not uh, you know, a little bit more exciting. Sylvia says, I'm surprised about the connection to names of the days of the week. Do you, uh, is there a connection to names of the months? Uh, so, oh, the names of the months. Uh, that's something uh, that uh, we haven't really talked about on our streams. Um, but uh, the names of the months uh, really come from, uh, that's where the Roman calendar really uh, comes into play here. And so the names of the months as we uh, associate them in modern times, are uh, really, they come from a Roman mythology, and that's uh, January, named for Janus, the god of doors and gates, as it was the doorway to a new year. February is Februalia, a time period when sacrifices were made to atone for sins. March, named for Mars, the god of war. Uh, April comes from the word apparire, which is Latin for to open, as in uh, the flowers opening in springtime. Um, May is named after a goddess of growth and plants. June, uh, Latin goddess Juno, July named after Julius Caesar, August named after Augustus Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar's uh, successor, uh, September, uh, which is comes from Latin for seven, because it used to be the seventh month before they added July and August, then October, uh, Latin for eight, November, Latin for nine, and December, Latin for ten. All right. Let's see. So Andrew says, hi, Patrick. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for watching. Glad to see you here. Uh, it's well into night here in London, and it's a rare evening of clear skies. I'm doing my best to follow along with the constellations. That's so awesome, Andrew. Thanks for watching all the way from London. Uh, and uh, thanks for watching uh, so late as well over there. Um, have you ever seen Stonehenge? Uh, I bet it's pretty amazing. If you haven't, you should definitely check it out, especially near a solstice, because as we learned on our stream today, it is tied to those. But uh, yeah, great to hear from you, Andrew. Thanks for watching. Sylvia says, uh, Katrina, my... Uh, Grand dog is named Rhea after the mother of Zeus. Oh, that's so awesome. 
Uh, Linda uh, says that Linda loves these. Well, thanks, Linda. I appreciate you for watching. Stephanie says, Phoebe's such a good girl tonight. She's loving the scritches. I've loved this uh, session. It seems like, almost like story time. Awesome, Stephanie. Well, thanks for enjoying that and thanks for appreciating Phoebe. She's being very chill. I think she was just napping. So she's just enjoying a little chill time, which is very awesome uh, and helpful for our stream. And I'm glad you're enjoying her company. She's enjoying seeing all of you tuning in tonight as well. Sarah asks, is there a constellation of Loki, the god of mischief? And uh, not that I'm aware of. And again, our understanding of Norse mythology and constellations is fairly limited. So perhaps there were some parts of Norse culture that did see constellations tied in with that god. Uh, but that is something that I will have to leave you to investigate yourself because we are now at the end of our tour today, our deep dive into uh, the sky cultures of the Celts and the Norse peoples. So thank you all so much for enjoying this live stream and tuning in. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this topic. It was a bit a bit of a hodgepodge of a lot of different topics. And uh, uh, like Stephanie said, just a bit of a story time. So I hope you enjoyed that today. Uh, don't forget, uh, if you haven't, uh, head over to our YouTube channel where you can find all of our past live streams. Uh, and you can uh, rewatch any of those. And uh, we have hit uh, 100 subscribers tonight. In fact, we're at 103. That is so awesome. If you haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. And hopefully we'll be posting even more content on there in the future. But well, we're going to roll right along to our next live stream next Monday uh, at 6 p.m. Stay tuned for the topic. We'll announce that soon. But we'll be right back here at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, same time, same place uh, next Monday. Same bird biting my ear. Uh, once again, I have been your planetarium specialist, Patrick Hess. Thank you for watching these live streams and thanks for supporting Union Station. Uh, thank you uh, as well to MRI Global, our live streams supporting sponsor, uh, and uh, thank you to everyone who's come out to the planetarium as well. As a reminder, we are open at the planetarium. We're open uh, Thursday through Sunday and starting in March, we'll be open Wednesday through Sunday. So if you're comfortable, we would love to see you at the planetarium. Uh, you can buy tickets online in advance uh, as well as um, uh, uh, or we are we're also so we are opening at the planetarium in the daytime but also we are uh we have just announced a slate of evening laser shows so evening lasers are back everyone uh check out our facebook page where we post the uh, posted the calendar and schedule for those but the first weekend of march we will be starting our evening laser shows once again and we've got a couple new artists coming in uh for the first time laser lizzo and as well uh, as well as a laser rush which is coming in may so a lot of exciting things happening at the planetarium and of course buying a Ticket to the Planetarium is a great way to support uh, the Planetarium moving forwards uh, and watching our live streams supports us as well. So uh, to everyone in the comment section, Kelly, uh, thank you for watching. Glad you enjoyed the myths and stories. Katrina, Mark, and Eric all saying thank you as well. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in tonight. Uh, I will see you next week at 6 p.m. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy this warm weather, everyone. Bye.